Hello, my name is Spencer Hay. I'm the co-founder and chief science officer at Prism Bio, and welcome to Discussing Data Science. My guest today is Brendan Guerin. So Brendan is my co-founder and the CEO of Prism Bio. But before founding Prism, Brendan was an analyst at Origami Capital, a private equity firm based in Chicago, where he was particularly involved in their biotech portfolio. Now, Brendan is also a partner at Argos Partners Holdings, an investor group that focuses on pet boarding and daycare facilities, as well as a personal investor and advisor to a handful of other startups and small businesses. And all this at the ripe old age of 23. So welcome, Brendan, and thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start with your work as an investment analyst? Can you sort of talk us through, in particular, would be great to hear kind of about the use and value of data in that role and some of the challenges you face, but it'd be great also just to kind of hear the story and, and what you were doing in that space. Yeah, absolutely. So I started investing uh, at a pretty early age uh, and got really quite fascinated with the public market. So originally when I started investing, so I actually got a book on investing when I was 10 and became very obsessed with the field and very interested in, you know, just becoming the best investor that I could be. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about what would be a good advantage to have as an investor. How could I really make myself differentiated in this field? And the thing that I always kept coming back to was just having a better grasp on the data than anyone else. And so um, I was always kind of a very math oriented person. I loved uh, that's I originally wanted to be a mathematician when I was very younger. I thought that would be fascinating. I eventually decided it might be more interesting to do something where it was the application of that. But for me, data and evidence was really the way that I could make the most sense out of the investment world that uh, you know I operated out of. Um, I also started investing at a fairly interesting time, I think, because um, it was right after the Great Recession uh, in the United States. And it was at a time where really you started to see, I mean, whatever, there were a lot of like uh, folks that were doing data-driven investment before that time period. But I would say like it was really starting to go mainstream and people were thinking a lot about this. And the traditional stock picker, was really something that was like fading into the into the background. So people that were, you know, traders doing things by hand, you know, you think of the days where the New York Stock Exchange had all these traders in the pit right. and whatnot. That was really disappearing and it was getting replaced, you know, with uh, you know, like a just a bunch of computers sitting on the New York Stock Exchange and, you know, algorithmic quantitative trading. And so um, I knew that I had to have an advantage uh, as an investor if I wanted to really differentiate myself. And so really started to spend a lot of time thinking about data. And so that was one reason why I really started to focus on the life sciences investment vertical was not only did I find that very interesting to read about, and I also had some probably some uh, lucky early uh, successes there. One of my uh, best investments ever was actually uh, in a biomed, which was uh, one of the biggest returners in the entire S&P 500. That was like a 20x wow. return on this on this uh, medical devices company. And so that was, you know, I think some good external motivation. But um, at the same time, I found it was a place where that I could, you know, there was a lot of complication in this field, right? You're not only looking at the individual dynamics of a company operating in the field, but you need to have an opinion on the research that's going on in the space and the companies that are surrounding it. And I think that's an area where it just requires a little bit more elbow grease than, you know, perhaps if you're just looking at like a consumer company where everyone comes in with the familiarity of what that company does. Um, this space just had a little bit more nuance. And so I spent a lot of time uh, reading, you know, research that was published around a company, trying to understand their competitors, going in, looking at, you know, data that was filed with the FDA and such, and trying to understand how is this company positioning itself and how is it different than the competitors that it operates in. And for me, that was really, um, you know, the most important thing when I was making investments in the life sciences space was to understand the technology that a company was applying and was that truly beneficial over the competitors? Because if it wasn't, Perhaps, you know, they had a good, you know, set of financial statements and they were performing well. But my thought was like, over time, that's always going to be, you know, a loser in the long run. And if you're not providing the best, you know, experience to to patients and the people that are ultimately using this, you can kind of make some money in the meantime, but it's not a long term play. And so that was really the hat that I wore um, when I was analyzing investments, um, uh, both within my professional role and also within my personal role. <music> Interesting. So, I mean, one of the things that I'd be curious to hear you say more about is like what, so you mentioned FDA, but like, what were the sources of research that you had access to? So like at your firm, were you guys like subscribing to journals or were you already kind of buying, you know, these big databases that have this stuff kind of like, what was the, the, the data itself that you sort of found, you know, useful or, or, uh, or not? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I'll break there. So there was data from the company itself. There were kind of three buckets, data from the company itself, public data, and then vendor data. Those were really the three broad buckets. The data from the company itself was really an in-depth view of the financial, all the board decks that they had, um, that they were presenting internally, uh, you know, data that we had requested in addition to this. So this was stuff, we were doing private investments, so you can request a lot more data around that than a public investor can. And so that was, you know, really rich source of data that we had that was like really, you know, um, from the company. But that, I think that's not the most interesting one to focus on. I think the interesting ones are kind of the other two. Um, so with public data, I would look for, we were, we did have subscriptions to journals, um, and we were, you know, we're subscribed to all the newsletters. So I was always closely following the news and really subscribed to anyone that was publishing on, uh, you know, business development, um, or investment opportunities in the life sciences space. And so that was kind of background information in my head. But when we were looking at an individual investment, um, you know, going onto public data sources, clinicaltrials.gov. PubMed, uh, FDA, all these things that are just out there and you can access as an individual um, would go out. And that was always a really good starting point for me to understand like the competitive landscape that a company operated in and kind of who their competitors were. And from there, you know, I would always go to the other competitors' websites. And um, especially if they're public, there's a bunch of things that they are required to disclose as part of being a public company. And so that was other information that was really interesting um, to look into. Um, from there, we got into the, you know, as an investment fund, uh, we were really in the business of uh, paying for a lot of different sources of data, because if that helps us avoid a mistake, then it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, just a minimal investment relative to the, to the cost of a bad investment. And so we would purchase vendor data sets. And that was really, it depended on the specific opportunity. So you kind of started off with the same data sources really for like a, uh, in the public domain. And from there we would go and we would find out who had the data that we need. So, um, you know, we were looking at a, a antibody discovery platform, for example, that one is one that I spent a lot of time uh, researching. And so we brought in a very well-known life sciences consultant to help us understand kind of the competitive landscape with the data that they had. They had basically, you know, spent a lot of time in this, this world. Uh, and so they had a really nuanced view of the technology in that space. So we worked with them and then we purchased uh, data sets from some of the kind of well-known uh, uh, folks in the area that provide, you know, market share data and sales data and whatnot. And so we would work a lot with those vendors as well. Uh, purchasing information. And then my job was really to take all this source of information and we would always have these giant files of data um, that would sit on our company drive and really synthesize it together. Um, one of the best investors uh, that I know described the investment process as you know really building a mosaic. And so it's thinking about every facet of a given company and really just doing a, you know, building your mosaic piece by piece and understanding the holistic picture. Some stuff you find is going to be good. Some is going to be bad and make you think it's a worse investment. But at the end of the day, what we were trying to do was build the most accurate mosaic that we possibly could, and then really hold that as its own and understand everything around an investment and then go in with that is your decision-making criteria. And that's why data was so important to me in my role is that um, I knew that there's a lot of external factors that influence whether something's a good investment. But if I build the most accurate picture that I can, at least I can, you know, rest easy knowing that I followed the right process and that I made the best decision that I could at that time. Wow, that's fascinating. How long did that process typically take? So, you know, you guys are looking to, right, like acquire, potentially acquire a company, right? So I assume there's like a due diligence process, like kind of what is the, you know, kind of beginning to end, putting together the mosaic, you know, how long does it take? And then kind of how long even from there to, and now a decision is made or whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at every, you know, place that uh, every fund that I've, I've worked at, it, it's, it's, it's a multi-month process. And so it really depends on the investment opportunity. Um, I would say for us, life sciences investment opportunities would take a little bit longer just because there's a little bit more complexity and you really want to understand, especially for us where it's like, we were not life science focused as a fund. We were a generalist fund that would invest in life sciences opportunistically. And so really wanted to make sure that we understood every you know crevice of the investment opportunity. And so I think an average timeline to just throw a number out there, like two to four months generally, and kind of culminating in this giant, you know, 100 page slide deck that really goes into depth on every bit. You know, what is this company? What does it do? How does the technology stack up versus legacy approaches? How does it stack up to the current a uh, set of competitors that might be trying to encroach in uh, on the market that they operate, who's the management team, you know, and, and really just digging into, and then a very in-depth financial model um, that, you know, we would build as well. And so 
really that was a, a multi-month process um, that would require, you know, uh, a lot of kind of going back and forth. So we always did this in like a, you know, a phased approach where it's kind of, you put together the minimum, you know, uh, amount of research that you, where you can understand it so that you're, you know, being efficient with time. And then we would look at all the opportunities that we had come across a given week. And then it's deciding which ones to focus in on. People have the opportunity to raise questions so that you have, you know, some additional ideas. Um, I would always have a list of questions that I would draft alongside building materials where it's like, okay, here's everything that I know now. What's the stuff that I need to look into? And so I would add in people's questions as they were asking it. And then we would go to the next phase. So you do a little bit more research. We would spend a little bit more of money, perhaps we engage experts. That's the other, I guess, vendor data set that we would think about is we would always talk to, you know, five, yeah. six, seven experts in the space and understand their opinion on the market. Cause that's, you know, another thing that's valuable to consider. And then really working towards that full, you know, investment pitch and full investment model where we can really understand all the different pieces. And that was really the living artifact um, that, you know, represented the mosaic. Um, at least it was living while we were creating it because we we're constantly adding to it. Um, and then it has a kind of final point uh, where you kind of like pause and then uh, make a go or no go decision on that investment. Yeah, yeah, that's, wow. Um, what, if, were there any sort of steps in the process that were like, you know, challenging or like tear your hair out? You're just like, oh no, I have to do this and like dreading it, but you know, you have to do it. Yeah, I would say, I would say like, uh, so the, the process there, it was a, it's a fairly manual process just across yeah. the board. And I think, um, you know, we you, you see those articles on like the average amount of time that, and, you know, investment bankers or analysts at, you know, private equity funds or hedge funds spend in the office. And I really do think that a lot of that comes from, this is a very like custom process, um, per investment. You know, we weren't like a quantitative fund where we're building out a series of algorithms that are going to judge and dictate whether we think something's a good investment or not. You know, we were we were focused on individual analyses of companies and opportunities. And so for us, this was always by definition a very manual process. And this was something that would require just a lot of time spent, you know, deep in research. And so I would say that a lot of the process, um, you know, was just, it, it was, it was a taxing process. I mean, when you finish the investment memo, it was always like a big, you know, sigh of relief where it's like, okay, like, you know, that, that was a, a big sprint and stuff. And so I would say though, the most complicated parts um, were synthesizing data that like for, I, I liked the financial modeling part. Like that was always a piece for me that um, was like fairly standardized where it's like, you have to build out the model and make sure it accurately reflects the operations of the company. But that was a piece that I was quite familiar with and like mm -hmm. kind of my background in like, you know, financial modeling and all that, you know, it, it really helped out with that. The piece that was always, I think, an area that I, you know, lost sleep over and really wanted to think about was, you know, understanding the research that underlied these companies. And this is coming from someone where it's like, I've been investing in the life sciences for a long time, but I am not, you know, a, a PhD biologist by training. And so I don't have that sort of background. And so really trying to come in with a degree of humility and trying to come in as someone who is, you know, admittedly not an expert in this space and trying to read through that required a lot of time. And I was always wanting to make sure that I wasn't missing any big pieces. And so not only was I reading about the company, Company, but I'm also trying to read, uh, you know, publications and other sorts of kind of like primers on the technology that we were investing in. And so that was a lengthy process because, uh, you know, I'm not a believer in investing in things that you don't understand. Um, with and so that was always a big piece of our process. So there you are, kind of grinding away at researching biotech investments, right? Loving the financial modeling bit, you know, but it sounds like it's a serious, serious amount of work, putting many hours in the day, kind of like you're putting these mosaics together, right? But you're making six figures right out of college. But you know, you're thinking, not good enough, right? I want something more, right? So, you know, I don't know if you're consciously thinking that, right? But we're, we're painting the, <laughs> sure. painting the picture yeah. here. Yeah. Um, because you're not doing that anymore, right? Now you're running prism. So talk a little bit about, you know, that process. I mean, maybe a little bit about how you and I met but also kind of what inspired you to want to take that step. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I remember the day where I really started thinking about the opportunity that we're working on today. And that it, it's very clear because that was a day that I read your stat news article. And so just for the background of for everyone that's watching, Spencer published this article in stat news. It really blew up. It went viral. It was on the front page for like a, for a whole week. Uh, and I remember it, 
it was looking at the clinical trial portfolios of the top 10 largest pharmaceutical companies and understanding um, all the disease areas that they were active in, what their trial portfolios looked like, and just a variety of data related to that. And so this was fascinating. I mean, I remember just being completely, you know, awestruck by this photo where it's just this extremely, extremely detailed and long visual where you can really understand like what is the view of like uh, the top 10 pharma companies and what are they doing with their time? And I'd never seen anything like this. I mean, you, you know, whatever, I would listen into the, the earnings calls from these companies and they have their own view on kind of where they sit in the market, but never do you have a holistic view like this ever. And so I remember just being awestruck and just pausing and really thinking about this and um, probably read that article three or four different times and then said, well, you know, whatever, I'm just this investment analyst and, you know, uh, but let, let, let me just reach out and just, I wanted to talk more because it was one of those things where it was just kind of sticking in my brain. And so um, reached out to you, we ended up, you know, meeting and discussing the opportunity. And one of the things that I was really struck by was kind of the similarities in the work that you did and that I did, even though it was two, yeah. you know, very different, you know, domains, I think at the end of the day, there were a lot of similarities in the, the sort of the work that we were doing and a lot of the same challenges and a lot of the same pain points where it's like, how do you synthesize this data that you're working with and come up with a clear and accurate picture of what you're looking at? And that was something that, you know, I would work towards with these investment pitches, but they were always static. They were always, you know, these, you know, point in time observations. And, um, you know, as you know, just not being in the you know data science field either, there were limitations in the way that I would analyze it. And so uh, I remember thinking, wow, this is a massive opportunity. This is really uh, quite interesting. And for me, what I think it represented in kind of the original, you know, pitch that we went out with was the Bloomberg for biomedicine. And I remember that I think there's a lot of similarities in the trajectory that the, you know, life sciences field and the way that they think about data uh, works and the financial industry and how they think about data. And Bloomberg was really this revolutionary, um, you know, product, this revolutionary technology that I think changed forever the way that um, you know, you made money as an investor. I mean, there were times where access to data was a problem and people, you know, if you were one who was reading 10 Ks and you were requesting it from companies, you would have proprietary information. Other folks weren't thinking about, mm -hmm. um, when Bloomberg standardized all this information and put it in one place. And I don't want to say that it's like pure access because it's, you know, it's, it's an expensive product for sure. But, um, there's others Yahoo finance that have really replicated, um, you know, key con, uh, key, you know, modules of the Bloomberg terminal, but, um, it really revolutionized it. And I think all of a sudden there, it really changed the game from who can gather data to who can make the best sense of the data. And I think mm -hmm. it really involved this fundamental shift um, in what was the advantage as an investor. And to me, I think that we're in the really early innings of that in the life sciences um, you know, data world. And I think this is a massive opportunity where this data is a lot more complex than what we see in the financial uh, ecosystem, right? I mean, like if you're looking at the, you know, uh, the P&L for a bunch of public companies and inputting that into Bloomberg, that's extremely valuable data. And I don't want to say that there's, you know, uh, not a lot of qualitative data in the just general financial uh, investment world because there, there is, but I think you see a really rich, different type of data in the life sciences world. There's a lot more complexity. There's a lot more underlying it. And I think this has slowed the ability to just put all that information out there and tie it together in a way that makes a lot of sense that you've seen in the financial uh, ecosystem. And that's really, I think, what interested me the most as I saw this as like a really revolutionary, and I see this as a really revolutionary idea to really help the life sciences data start to look more similar to what we see in other industries. Because I think once you get to that point, there's just a lot more interesting work that goes on once everyone kind of has the same access to data and people can really get their arms around that. To me, that's really the starting point for a you know much richer and more vibrant life sciences ecosystem where um, there's a lot more progress and a lot more, you know, knowledge generation, insight generation, people have more time to think it's not as much time spent manually creating data, trying to pull it all in. So that was what interested me. And I thought this was a really revolutionary thing. Well, so let's then just pick up on exactly that point. So the Bloomberg for biomedicine, which you've already described beautifully, um, so that's sort of where we started, right? We ran with this idea and I'll throw up some screenshots of the early <laughs> wireframes that you put together in, um, you know, PowerPoint, but maybe talk a little bit more. So, I mean, well, I'll, I'll set, I'll set the stage a little bit. So, you know, you participated in this um, sort of pitch competition at Boston college as you were finishing up your undergrad. 
right? And sort of pitched the Bloomberg for biomedicine. And kind of the cornerstone of that was a sort of dashboard I think I had made kind of on the basis of the wireframes that we had worked on together, right? That showed at least some vision of this, right? Like imagine you could have all the data, you know, at your fingertips, you have these kind of interactions, right? Um, so you went out with that pitch, what happened? Yeah, the, re the reception was great. So this was something that I not only pitched at the, you know, the straight off venture competition at Boston College, but this was also something that I just spent a lot of time talking to other friends that I had, people that were, you know, mentors, folks that were older than me in the financial, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem talking about, hey, here's this idea that I've got, like, what do you think? And I think for everyone that I spoke to really saw this as, you know, a transformative technology and really interesting. And so kind of used that, put together the initial wireframe and we went to go pitch at Boston College. I think it was really interesting. And I think that's where I really started thinking like, okay, you know, we're, we're onto something here. So we ended up winning first place in that competition. Um, and really based off of this initial, you know, wireframe, this idea. And I think it was just something that was tantalizing and that people really were able to relate to. I think a lot of folks know kind of what a Bloomberg terminal is. Folks don't know as much perhaps about the challenges of data and life sciences, unless you're in that world. But I think people see the potential and they understand why that's important. And I think that, yeah, really good reception ended up, you know, winning first place, winning an initial check that we, you know, we were able to use to kind of start incorporating the company and all that. So that was great. And also received an invitation um, from SSC Venture Partners to apply for their accelerator program. So this accelerator with Boston College and received that where all of a sudden we had, you know, investor interest where it's like, hey, this is a really interesting technology. Have you thought about pursuing this full time? Um, and I remember that was just a really interesting conversation because at the time, you know, it was an idea I was exploring. And then I think that really started to help me understand that, like, you know, this is not just like one idea and thing of investigation, but like, let's put this into practice. Like, let's get this out into the real world. And that was a really exciting moment. Now, what's interesting, though, is this isn't how Prism brands itself today, right? Like, I think if you go on our website right now, we don't say Bloomberg for biomedicine anywhere. Well, like, why do you think that is? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the opportunities that, you know, we started to see as we were going out into the market with our idea was that I think the idea is even bigger than perhaps what originally we were thinking about. And so, you know, when we first started out, I, you know, I was thinking about how do we arm the life sciences investor with the data that they need to make good investment decisions? A pretty specific use case around that. Um, at the beginning of Prism, we had a lot of conversations with folks, whether that was, you know, biotech VCs, whether that was folks that worked in pharma, folks in academia, all sorts of adjacent fields. We really spent a lot of time speaking with people. Um, and I think what I started to realize and what we as a company started to think a lot more about was there's more people that need access to a product like this. And it's not just specific to the investor group. And so, you know, the Bloomberg for biomedicine framing really was, um, you know, to resonate well. I think you talk to an investor about Bloomberg for biomedicine, they pretty instantly get a picture in their head of what that yeah. would entail. Um, when we're talking to folks in the drug development space, whether that's pharma companies or biotech companies, I think that's where a lot of the opportunity lies. And I think one of the things that we find really exciting about that vertical is this is an opportunity to arm folks in data that not just are funding the trials in the way that an investor might be, but these are the folks that are, you know, really in initiating the trials, running the research and really, you know, if, if you look at the, you know, they're the ones that uh, own the assets that they're trying to move through the development yeah. pipeline. And so, I think that's a really interesting opportunity and for, you know, a company like Prism mission driven, where we want to really make a difference in the lives of, uh, of, of patients and the folks that are, you know, going through these trials. I think that that's a really interesting opportunity because I think that's an ability, that's a type of, um, you know, market that we can operate in where we can make real change. And I think for us, the life sciences ecosystem is so complicated and there's so many different parties involved in it. I think that looking at pharma as a place to start off with our product is extremely interesting. And so that's, um, you know, been a big focus for us. And I think that's been highly impactful. And I'm really excited about the work that we've done there. And there's a lot more great things to come. But I think that's been one of the biggest, you know, things that we've done uh, in shifting away from kind of the Bloomberg for biomedicine towards the framing that we have today. Why don't we shift now to our three questions? Sure. So what do you see as the biggest data gaps out there in the field? Yeah. Um, so, you know, wearing my investor hat, I think the thing that I was always trying to, you know, spend a lot of time on, I think where a lot of my effort was, was, you know, thinking about 
where, when I'm building my mosaic, where are the gaping holes in my mosaic and yeah. like kind of thinking about those. But even beyond that, because I think for the most part, as we spent time talking to the management teams of companies, talking to experts in the field, doing our own analyses and things like that, identifying where there were holes and filling them, I think was generally, you know, pretty self-explanatory for us where it's like someone would mention something, what is that? Let's dig into that and spend a bunch of time going down a rabbit hole around that. What was really hard about, you know, the the analysis of the data that we were working with, and I think where we had the biggest gap was actually in linking this data together. And so I think a lot of times, I mean, the mosaic perhaps is a great way of thinking about this because we kind of have these like little sections that were sitting on their own, these islands yeah. of analysis and data. And the question really, I think, was what am I missing? So I'm holding all these ideas both in my head, but also in this kind of like PowerPoint presentation, which is really the the currency that exists in you know yeah. the, in the investment world, but it's not super conducive to understanding links between data. I mean, if you just think about what a PowerPoint presentation is, by definition, it's very you know mosaic like. It's very like one section of analysis flip, one section of analysis flip, and so you know I spent a lot of time trying to think about like how do I put these pieces together how do they influence one another you know how do I understand the way that a company is positioning itself and then over here I'm doing analysis on their competitors and people that are trying to break into their space how should that be influencing this company mm -hmm. and the way that they're positioning themselves um, how does the you know financial performance of this company over the past five years uh, how does that impact perhaps their product development timelines the what they're working on you know the the different areas that they're investigating internally and I think that that was always an area that was extremely complicated. And so I was, you know, wanting to understand these connections better and really try to not only just build this mosaic, but really tie it together in a way where you could see connections between these different islands of data. And so yeah. that was always an area that was uh, a, a big focus for us. The other one that I think was really interesting was um, taking the more kind of like human qualitative opinionated sort of piece and overlaying that into the way that we built uh, our analyses and data. So where are there assumptions and where are things not, you know, the most data driven? Where, when I'm talking to an expert, are they speaking based off of data? Where, when I'm talking to an expert that we're interviewing, is this a little bit more of like an opinion-based or intuition-based thing? And that was always complicated because that was just very different data. When you're taking kind of the transcript from an interview yeah. with an expert or when you're looking at like even like a public company's transcript or whatnot and trying to synthesize the right information to pull out of there, that was always just a really different type of data than what we were working with. It's hard to put that into a financial model. And so that was always a piece that you know, was complicated. And I think that's just an area of big, you know, that's that's hard to 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 isolate when you're thinking about data is how do I really separate in my head what's fact from what's opinion? And I think that's really important. And I spent a lot of time thinking about that as an investor and trying to get better at that. But it is still a huge area of complication. <music> Well, all right. So you've touched on this a little bit already when you were sort of talking about the opportunity with the Bloomberg for biomedicine, but is there anything in particular? So question two, what excites you the most about the future of research? But, you know, is there some element in there, like a particular kind of, you know, development that you see happening? You're like, oh, this is going to be transformative when we, you know, when this comes down the, down the pipe. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like one of the opportunities that I'm really excited about is I think that we're seeing a lot more, um, you know, activity and kind of the like living research space. So this is something that we not only talk about at PRISM, and I'm not just talking about this given that, but I think that this is something that we're seeing a lot more of, and we're seeing better, you know, connections between data sets that people are producing. I think we're seeing a lot more kind of like integrations in the ecosystem, and we're seeing a lot more folks build platforms with the intent of communicating with other platforms. And I think that this is really interesting. And I think this is going to be extremely transformative because, you know, when I was, you know, working as an investor, a lot of times what we were faced with was either we had very specific data sets or software solutions that really were custom built to do just one thing. And that's kind of what they did. And that was helpful. But by definition, it just added to kind of the islands of data that we were talking about with the data gaps above. Um, the other thing that we worked with was consulting firms. And that was great because like they were a little bit more, you know, holistic in the way that they thought about investment opportunities. But at the same time, like they didn't have the same skin in the game that we did as an investor. They weren't getting kind of like paid based off the failure or success of this. And so there were always some skepticism with regards to the analyses. We would have them kind of point their 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 focus on you know specific issues we were dealing with in the investment opportunity, but they kind of had a broader view, but they weren't 
you know, investors by background and they weren't, you know, investing in this company. And so, you know, where I really see opportunity is in the kind of like middle space between those. So thinking about, you know, folks that are performing living research, thinking about folks that are pulling together different sources of information. I think that's extremely interesting. And if I put on my investor hat and think about that, all of a sudden, you know, it really transforms this static, you know, PowerPoint presentation that we were, you know, was the final result of our investment research. Um, and we would update our financial models regularly, of course, and everyone does that. But a lot of the more qualitative research that you would do really like kind of stood at one point in time. And so I think a lot of times there were a lot of, you know, ideas that would just kind of be held in your head that maybe were accurate at the time of the investment, but maybe the you know dynamics of the market, maybe the competitive set that you're looking at, maybe that's shifted fundamentally. And so um, I think that this is just a big barrier for an investor and it doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't benefit anyone when people have ideas that are kind of legacy ideas kind of stuck in their head. And so I'm really excited about seeing, you know, data sets that are living and breathing and structured in a way that they can really provide value over time. And I think as we're starting to see more and more of that, we're just going to see better decisions being made. We're going to see winning companies get funded. We're going to see companies that aren't, you know, uh, that aren't winners, that aren't developing interesting technology, uh, not receive funding. And so I'm just excited about more evidence-based decisions being made because that benefits everyone in the ecosystem. And so I think everyone is motivated to kind of move in that direction. And so really, I think as we start to see more of those living analyses, we're just going to see better and better decision make, uh, decisions being made. And as we kind of see more and more data able to really get you know, synthesized into one approach, we're going to see more and more value being generated of this ecosystem. So I'm extremely excited about that. Nice. I mean, one thing I'd be curious to pick up on there. So is thinking about, so I know there's been for a long time talk about kind of living evidence reviews in academia. Yeah. And, you know, I think sort of, you know, going back to the genesis of PRISM, right? I mean, that was one yeah. of the things that you and I could connect about, right? It's like, oh, we both sort of saw this, you know, both challenge and opportunity. The fact that, you know, you have the systematic review that's considered kind of like the gold standard, you know, for evidence synthesis. But it takes a really long time to do, right? It's like experts spend months or like a year and then it sits in the peer review process. And so what you get out, like what is the gold standard, what you get out the other side is a static document that the best case scenario is this gives you a very rich picture of like one question like 12 months ago, right? Yep. Or the answer to one question, yep. you know, that's like 12 months old. And sometimes that's enough, right? But it seems like sometimes that's not going to be enough and how can we ever like you know how can we ever really take the next step if it's taking experts all this time like and labor right to produce answers that are 12 months old right yeah. um but that being said you know well yeah it's like we've been talking about acad academics have been talking about that for like at least 10 years right and it seems yeah. like you know in that realm not really seeing the shift so i don't know so be curious to hear you say just a little bit more about like, you know, where you see this shift happening, right, towards like living reviews. I mean, obviously, this is like part of what PRISM is doing, but like, you know, outside of that, but also curious if like how that kind of academic product is, as like a publication potentially factored into your thinking when you were doing investment research. Like, did you sort of look for reviews or did you already kind of, you know, recognize that, you know, that was going to give you this kind of old snapshot? Yeah, for sure. So we, I, I think like when we were doing investment research, if we could find, you know, a reputable, you know, systematic review that was yeah. relevant to the space that we're in, like that was like, you know, the holy grail. That was really exciting. Even if it is old, I think it is a really good like point in time observation yeah. that we could factor into our decision making process. And it's funny because in some ways, very different output and, you know, kind of different, you know, process being followed to compile it. But in a way, like, it's funny because like that was one of the things that really struck me was like the final output of like a systematic review and the final output of, you know, an investment pitch. There's a lot of similarities between those documents, like they're different purpose. They're built in a different way. Um, what I think, though, is like with the investment space, I think we're seeing more and more people starting to think about like, especially, I mean, one of the easy ones that I think people are thinking a lot more about is like tracking competitive universes and tracking like, okay, I'm going to make an investment decision at time X. How do I think about how my competitive set evolves over time? And some of that is like, if you're investing in a public company, you're going to hear that on, you know, the earnings calls. People are going to be asking about that. If you're, you know, investing in a private company when they're doing their board presentation, like a lot of times you're going to hear about that as well. 
well. But I think we're starting to see more tools that have really been built around like continuing to follow, you know, what is going on in the space um, that you've invested in. And so to me, that's really just step one, though. I think ideally what you would want to see is just minimizing the amount of time that exists between these kind of like, you know, research artifacts and really making it so that it's like, if I'm going to build and spend a lot of time crafting an analysis, like to me, it's just the second step. And like, I think we need the tools to do this. And I think that's been a gap, but you know, once we have those tools and they're being made currently, there's tons of progress on that front where the technology is really getting in a spot that you can do this. I think what you're going to see is you're just going to see a lot of like living, you know, investment analyses, living pitch decks where it's like, Either, you know, you've got your point in time here and you can click to kind of see the living data set, or perhaps you even see, you know, people that are a little bit more tech um, focused starting to like produce these within environments where you can kind of see updates in real time. And I think that would be really, really important because as part of the investment and portfolio management piece, um, you know, you want to understand the changes that are going on within the ecosystem. And I think what we see a lot of times is, you know, you're seeing updates on LinkedIn, you're following the news. Um, you're going to have your quarterly board call or something like that. But really, I don't think that people approach that piece of the investment process with anywhere near the same level of rigor that you approach the initial investment decision. And, you know, there's a lot of data to suggest there's a lot of research that's being done that, you know, you know, your when you exit in some ways is just as important as when you enter. And like, I think there's a lot of investors that think a lot about when am I going to enter this company, but they don't think about as much about, you know, exit. And so I think that that's just an important piece that needs to be more involved um, in, to make good investment decisions and really maximize ROI. And how I think we're going to see this play out is firms that are thinking more about this. I mean, that's one of the nice parts about the investment uh, sphere is that if it truly is, um, you know, the case that you produce better investment returns when you factor in these living analyses, those firms are going to produce better returns over time. People are going to wonder what are they doing over there where they're getting these returns. And you're going to start to see other people shift their behavior to copycat that and try to improve their own investment returns. And so that's one part I really like about the investment space is I think best practices tend to take hold pretty quickly because it's like if it truly is the case that you're generating better returns, everyone wants an NOI and try and you know copy that for themselves. <music> All right, question three, Brendan. Wave the magic wand. What would you change about research or the industry? Yeah, I think for me, a lot of this is going to be around like the human dynamics that are involved. And so I think that to me, that's the hardest part. I mean, it's like the progress that we've seen on the technology front for all these issues, right? You're looking at living research, looking at the amount of data we have access to. I mean, it's like you've never, there's never been a time like this ever before. What has moved slower than I frankly thought would be like a lot of the like attitudes and a lot of the dynamics around kind of the human element of this. And so if I could really wave a magic wand, I think I would want everyone to come into this with a really data-driven attitude. And I would also want people to really play nice in the sandbox. And so I think there's been opportunities in areas like, I think about the travel industry actually as, an, as, a, as a group that's done really well with this, where there's great data sharing. I mean, if you look at like Expedia, if you look at like the, you know, hotel industry and the metrics that they share with one another, it's actually fairly routine where people will go out and they will compile together data and say, hey, what's your occupancy? Um, help me understand what your average booking rate has been and all this mm. stuff. And it's really funny because if you think about one single hotel, do I want to share all this information about my performance? It's anonymized, but do I want to share all this information on my performance? Like you might think no originally, if you're just kind of thinking purely in your own, you know, I want to beat my competitors. I want to make as much money as I can, but there's all these benefits that occur, not only for us consumers, but also for these hotels, when you start to share that information and when you start to do that, all of a sudden you have a richer picture of, you know, okay, I am not getting the level of occupancy. I'm not getting the pricing that I want to get. So like, what do I need to change to make sure that I'm competitive in this new, you know, uh, ecosystem? And so that's just one case study of an, an industry that's like, I think really benefited from data sharing. But I think that there's a large degree of, um, you know, people are protective over their data in the life yeah. sciences ecosystem. And rightly so, there's some really important reasons that that's the case. 
But I think the more that we see people sharing information, the more that we see people wanting to integrate with other data sets and kind of build that into the way that folks are creating products in this world, I think we're just going to see a lot better results because this isn't the kind of thing where you can kind of stand on your own island and really just be doing your own thing. I think in order for us to realize the benefits of all of this data, we need to have a better attitude collectively around sharing that data, around working together and around making data-driven decisions. I mean, whether it's the investment world, whether it's pharma, whether it's academia, I think we still see a lot of cases where there's a lot of things that, you know, are maybe more based off opinion and intuition. And we see cases where that, you know, in the public domain all the time, where that, you know, decision making leads to bad results. And so what I would really want is for people to just kind of have this, you know, almost this cold removed approach on this, where it's like, hey, we want to share data, we want to maximize the value of the total ecosystem here. And if we do that, you know, the best folks are going to win out. And, you know, I think if that is the case, we're going to see a lot of societal benefits. And I really do think the way that like efficient markets should run is in that way where it's, you know, everyone's sharing the information, people are really competing to become best in class and focusing on that versus, you know, how do I increase my competitive advantage by, you know, deciding which data I'm going to share or not share and all that. And that, you know, that is a way you can win out in a market, but I don't think that's the the healthy way for them to, to function. And I don't think that's, you know, where we're going to end up long-term. Um, and so I think it's really just a matter of time before, you know, we start to see more of these dynamics, but that's the piece for me is really, I think when we get those attitudes woven into the way that people think about, um, you know, the life sciences data ecosystem, I think we're going to really see, you know, a lot of people just, you know, you know, play nice in the sandbox and really like an explosion of uh, progress. And, you know, I mean, we've seen that firsthand at PRISM involved in, in groups like the Pistoia Alliance, where there are people that, you know, yeah. want to work together in a pre-competitive way. There are folks that want to really collaborate together on adding value together and maximizing, um, you know, the value of data that they're producing. And so I'm really excited. I think trends like that are just going to increase and we're going to see more and more activity on that space. And we're going to start to see faster progress as a result of it. Brendan, thanks so much for having this conversation with me today. You and I talk all the time, but it's really nice to sort of, you know, delve back into some of the history and your expertise in the investment space. So thanks for, for joining me. Yeah, thank you. This has been a fun walk down memory lane and thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everybody for tuning in on episode two, more episodes to come. Um, and if you want to follow along and never miss an episode, please hit like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.